Hi, everyone, and welcome to the GigaOM webinar on Do You Know the True Cost of Your Enterprise Mobility Decisions? I'm Mike Jeanette. I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. And with me, I have uh, Andrew Duncan, the Vice President of Product Management and Tech Solutions at SpectraLink, and also David Krebs, who's the Executive Vice President of Enterprise Mobility and Connected Devices with VDC Research. And uh, guys, I wanted to give you a minute to introduce yourselves. Uh, Andrew, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So, uh, as you mentioned, I run the product management team here at Spectralink. Uh, come from a background in mobility, have about uh, 25 years in, uh, in various roles in the mobility space, uh, building phones, uh, building tablets, uh, working on enterprise software for mobility, and uh, doing that across a variety of companies. Uh, including uh, Palm, HP, Intel, uh, and others as well. And uh, I've been at Spectralink here about three years, uh, driving forward the uh, the new technologies that we're putting in place uh, at Spectralink. That's great. I, I, I saw you, you didn't mention Sun Microsystems. I mean, that's dear to a lot of people's yep. hearts. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That was a uh, fun time in uh in my history, helping them out with uh, with product development process and figuring out uh, building uh, building devices there as well. Yeah, absolutely, that's fantastic. And uh, also, we have David Krebs here. David, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so this is David. I'm with a firm called uh, VDC Research. We're a full service um, technology research and advisory firm, um, and I'm responsible for uh, two of our practice areas. Uh, those include uh, enterprise mobility as well as automatic identification technologies. And so I lead a, a team of analysts here, and our charter really is to um, research and analyze how organizations, both public sector and, and private sector, are uh, leveraging uh, mobile solutions, leveraging digital tools uh, to support their, uh, their frontline mobile workforce and really looking at that intersection of mobile and digital uh, solutions and, and uh, workers, how they go about doing their work, how they go about collaborating, how they go about uh, supporting customers uh, is really the uh, sort of the sweet spot of the, of the research that, uh, that we conduct. Uh, that's great. Thank, thanks both of you for joining today. I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And for those of you who don't know me, um, once again, my name is Mike Jeanette, and I am a researcher with GIGO. My focus on uh, mobility and IoT and other emerging technologies, and I um, have spent a, a number of years uh, working in the mobile space. So it's, it's something dear to my heart and something I, I enjoy talking to. And Andrew, uh, you know, David and I are both analysts, so I'm, I'm expecting you to, to keep <laughs> us, you know, kind of grounded here in the real world of not going off in our esoteric ways as we go through this. So. I'll do my best. <laughs> you're you're going to be our referee today. <laughs> I like to daydream with you guys every now and then, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep things on the straight and narrow for today. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right, great. Well, let's jump right in, and I, I just want to give everyone a, a quick view of our agenda, really kind of what we're going to be covering today. So uh, as we look at uh, mobility on the whole and the costs around mobility, uh, we're going to be looking at the critical elements of mobility itself uh, from the device all the way through to uh, the support and uh, costs associated with that. And then taking a look at um, purpose-built solutions and how, you know, we've kind of come from this, this world of uh, consumer mobile to needing devices in the enterprise space that actually work for what we're trying to do and aren't just a, a one-size-fits-all. One and from there, we'll get into some of the key successes as you, as you go through that journey. And really, you know, when we look at mobility, mobility is really at the forefront of digital transformation. And so this journey is incredibly important as you get started on the road to digital transformation. And if you do it right in the enterprise space with mo enterprise mobility space, you're going to be able to do it right in a lot of other areas. And on top of that, we want to give uh, everyone in the audience a chance to ask your questions. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, lot of history here, a lot of... Uh, knowledge and experience, and I'm hoping to share that with you today. So please feel free to uh, submit questions throughout. We'll get to them at the, uh, the end of the webinar. So one thing I wanna do is before we even get started, I wanna jump right into a poll. And we're gonna have a few questions throughout the, uh, the webinar to really kind of get a feel for where you guys are uh, from the perspective of where you are on your journey, things that you're looking at, how your organizations work. So our, our first poll question is, does your organization have a BYOD policy, bring your own device, or do you provide devices to your employees? And so we have a couple options here. You either have a fully implemented BYOD in your organization, 
Uh, B is corporate owned, so you, you provide the devices, or do you have a mixed policy? Do you have some people that bring their own? Do you have purpose-driven devices that you, you give out to some employees? So I want to go ahead and open up the poll and give you a minute to answer that. So, David, I want to, while we're waiting for people to answer, um, I know in my research we saw a big shift at BYOD, and then it seemed to kind of come back. Have you, have you seen that same kind of thing? Yeah, uh, I, I would certainly concur with that. I think uh, you know BYO, and I, and I think the sort of the the, the promise of BYO of reducing cost of mobility uh, certainly was um, you know a sort of catalyst um, for for a lot of the initial investments. But in particular, when it comes to um, deploying and supporting mobile solutions that are you know closely line, aligning with you know workflows and with specific work groups. Um, you know, there there are some, you know, certainly some hidden costs of BYO that went unanticipated and, you know, some of the fragmentation in the mix uh, that BYO introduced um, also, you know, created, uh, especially for those, you know, for those solutions, for those more sophisticated uh, line of business uh, mobile solutions created a, a lot of havoc. So I, th I think, uh, you know, in particular in those sort of capacities, we saw um, you know, some pullback, some pushback, and, and there are other sort of factors, you know, clearly also around privacy and security uh, that um, I think also impacted or maybe, you know, slowed the um, sort of the on, on, on plot of BYO. Yeah, I, I know the security aspect scared a lot of, a lot of us CISOs in the, in the industry. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and close the poll uh, and take a look at uh, what our audience is looking at today. So, yeah, and David, I mean, that, that's right on with what you were talking about. I mean, the, the BYOD policies have, you know, I, I remember back when it was 40, 50 percent at BYOD. And now, I mean, looking at this group right here, you know, it's it's pretty low. Um, anything anything surprising to you that you're seeing these results or they, they seem to align pretty much with what you were talking about? Yeah, I think they align pretty well. I mean, I think there's there's always going to be some level of, of sort of, you know, you see here six and 10 uh, respondents or 60 percent suggesting some kind of a mixed use. And I think. For certain, you know, sort of categories within the workforce, BYO I, I think makes perfect sense. Um, but to be BYO only across the entire workforce, um, I think today is, is is somewhat atypical. So I, I think that's that's yeah. certainly align with uh, what uh, what we've seen in our research as well. Yeah, I tend to yeah, agree there yeah. as well. I think my from what we see across our customer base at Spectralink. Uh, very similar. Uh, a lot more tendency towards corporate-owned devices for frontline workers who rely on that device to do very critical elements of their role and more a fallback to BYO type of situations for folks that uh, may not fully need that device 24-7 uh, using it all the time, but it's more periodic and information access and uh and those yeah andrew i think you bring up a really good point there and it, it is the you know is it, is it specific to needs or is it just that general email calendaring capabilities and those types of things all right yeah. great well I, I think that gives us some great information on the poll to start with so let's go ahead and jump into our next topic and this is really going to be kind of the the meat of what we're looking at and it looks at the the critical mobile needs across the board and what we've done for this webinar is we've taken a look at really five critical elements of mobile. And they span across productivity, performance, durability, management, and through to support. So it's really that, that soup to nuts. And it's, it's a big part of what we're looking at because I know that the mobile workforce is, is huge. And David, I know you have some, some information on some statistics on really what kind of um, mobile workforce we're looking at, how many people depend on mobile in this, in, this present time. Do you, can you give us a little information about that before we jump into these? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we do a lot of research in terms of um, sort of understanding, you know, the time spent on your feet or in some type of mobile capacity. And I think, you know, sort of one begets the other. So in terms of the overall workforce today, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of total workers are what we would identify or classify as as mobile workers. In other words, they're spending more than, you know, 50% of their of their day, of their shift, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, away from a sort of a fixed location, you know, on your feet, um, you know, in front of assets, in front of customers, and you know, doing something in a in a very sort of mobile uh, mobile state. So that that represents, in terms of sheer numbers, 
you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.2, 1.3 billion workers uh, worldwide uh, who are mobile. And, you know, I think mobile technology in and of itself has certainly ushered in this or has, has, has accelerated uh, this, this trend in the sense that, uh, you know, we're not working like we used to. Um, with mobile, we have access to information, you know, virtually anywhere we are. So, you know, there's there certainly has been a downside of that in the sense that uh, mobile has introduced work into, um, you know, maybe a dinner or, you know, maybe late nights, and, and sometimes it's hard to shut off. But I think it's also enabled um, enabled us to, um, you know, to, to also be much more pro productive in, in the sense that it is, you know, providing access to, uh, you know, critical information, sort of where you need it, when you need it. Uh, but, but I, so I think one has, one has certainly influenced, uh, influenced the other. Well, it's funny when you talk about that into the late night, you know, I, I know a lot of the digital natives, you know, they, they know nothing but mobile. So it, yeah. it's, it's an interesting time. You, you got to find that way to, to cut it off, and I, I'm sure that also comes into effect of needing to um, cut off access for certain individuals and in, within you know different verticals and stuff such as that. And I, um, Andrew, I'm sure you you could talk to that. And, you know the the ability to to regulate that productivity, make sure that they're using the the applications, the devices, and the systems that they should be using, rather than just kind of free forming. Absolutely. I mean that's uh, that's one of the key elements for enterprises. You know, the devices that people are bringing into work today go beyond just voice, and they're, they're really all aspects of communication, access to internet, access to data, access to workflows, and as a, uh, a device that's really critical for getting the, the role done, you need to keep the, uh, the workforce on task and be able to, uh, to control what there's access to and how to do that. Uh, the industry as a whole really relies on the role of enterprise mobility management software or EMMs in order to, uh, to regulate that on the devices. Roles can be set up for, uh, for individuals. Roles can be set up by, uh, by group. So uh, functions, areas can all have different access policies based on their role in the company, what they're doing, and, and what the company needs in order for them to be productive. Yeah, well, that, that, gets, that gets to the topic I want to dive right into, which is, is productivity. And, you know, mm -hmm. when, we, when we look at employee productivity, you know, I mean, we, we hear the stories of people, you know, being on Facebook all day and that, that type of thing. Okay. But what, what becomes more important, I think, is, is having the right mobile solutions. I, I remember when I was working in mobility back at HP, um, back in oh, 2008 or so, and we were trying to come up with mobile applications that would work for the enterprise space. And one of the most important ones we came up with was a mobile company directory. And, you know, it, it seems, you know, happenstance today because it, it's just part of, you know, Outlook, that type of thing. But back then, you know, it was a solution that was just huge for everyone because all of a sudden they, they were able to find people, find out how to connect with people. And I think that's that's a big part of having the right solutions for productivity, not just in the applications, but also in the devices. And um, Andrew, I, I'd love to hear some some ideas from you on, you know, where you think the devices are going from, a, you know, we've got the consumer devices, but having devices that are specific to productivity in the enterprise, you know, and what, what works, mm -hmm. what you're seeing there and what makes sense. So it really comes down to a complete solution. Uh, as, as we go forward, we're seeing customers not buy phones just for, for voice anymore. Voice is certainly a, uh, an important aspect of a phone uh, purchase, a smartphone purchase. It has to be there. It's expected to have good call quality, all of that. But you don't buy a smartphone just to do voice. You buy the smartphone for those applications that uh, that it enables. So, you know, within different verticals, let's take two examples. Within the, uh, the healthcare space, uh, it used to be, if you back up not all that long ago, uh, phones were tethered to a desk at a nurse station and alerts went off in a patient room. You'd have to hear them, broadcast them down the hallway. It was loud. It was annoying. And nurses constantly running back and forth and lost productivity uh, with all of that. Now we're in a situation where with a, uh, a smartphone, a purpose-built smartphone with a scanner in it, for example, 
nurse can walk into a patient room, scan a wristband, the, uh, the hospital's chosen uh, electronic health records can come in and uh, via that scan can be fed into the record system, bring up that patient records, the nurse is able to access that patient record, make updates right there in the room, uh, can consolidate information across uh, multiple machines in the room, and then as the nurse leaves to go down and help the next patient down the hallway, rather than getting a, uh, a call from a nurse call system built into the bed and having that route back to the, uh, the nurse stand, it can go to directly the person that's working with that patient. And they're able to evaluate right away whether, hey, is this an urgent need or something that can wait till I'm finished with the current patient. Back and forth, all of those alerts and alarms, being able to access patient data, look at waveforms, uh, is puts that information right at that hand of that user wherever they're at, uh, really smooths that workflow. I've seen estimates of cutting miles of steps out back and forth between rooms and uh, and that main nurse stand within a, a given ward. It's, uh, it's amazing the transformation we're seeing in healthcare. We really see the same thing in other industries as well. If we look at the uh, the retail space, Andrew, Andrew before, before you before yes. you get into retail, I, I have a question on the on the healthcare. I, I'm sure a lot of people sure. say, well, why why can't why can't they do that with their own device? Why can't they do that with their iPhone? And I mean, is is there is there capabilities with consumer devices, or is it really you know something that you have to have a purpose driven device for now? So you know you can, but it's not ideal, right? It comes into total cost of ownership. Those other devices aren't built rugged. Um, if you take a consumer grade device, uh, be it in a healthcare environment, if that phone's been in the patient room, before you go to another patient room uh, and potentially bring bugs and germs and things that are, are on that device, you wanna clean off things that have been in the one patient room before it goes to the next one. So there's cabicide and other germicidal wipes and ointments and uh, cleaning materials that hospitals use in order to uh, to clean a device before when it moves room to room, those uh, those cleaning agents, those hospital grade cleaning agents, will degrade the plastics uh, in most of the phones. They'll cause the glue that holds the screens in in the smartphones to separate and cause the devices to fall apart. The those devices also just aren't rugged, uh, so they're going to fall apart uh, when you're dropping them and. Quite honestly, that happens quite a bit. Uh, so you've got to really be able to stand up. And then probably most important, when we started off this discussion, we talked about you know, voice may not be a driver for the only thing you want to do, but it is vital and important to, uh, to have that. Uh, and good quality voice is something that consumer devices just don't do nearly as well particularly if it's a uh, voice over Wi-Fi device and you're trying to roam access point to access point, if that roam takes too long, and too long can be in the hundreds of milliseconds kind of range, uh, in, that, uh, in that length of time, uh, dropped packets will happen, you'll hear jitter, you'll hear uh, warbling in voices on a call, potentially seconds of a call may drop out, or, uh, or you could lose the connection altogether. And so making sure that, uh, that voice quality remains high is really key. If you can imagine a nurse talking to a doctor, the doctor's relaying how much medicine to dispense to a patient and what those, uh, those dosing orders are, being able to hear the difference between 0.5 and 5, if that word point drops out, as uh, as the doctor's relaying something, that's critical to a patient. Potentially, they're they're getting overdosed ten times the amount they were supposed to get, and uh, you know bad results happen. So, really want to concentrate on good quality voice, great connections. It's just it's critical in that healthcare situation. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. That that actually gets us right right into our next topic, which is performance of devices. And um, I'd like to spend a little time talking about that. As you know, we look at you know the the idea of what you were just talking about with consumer grade devices not being designed, you know, not even for not just from a, a power and stability point of view, but actually from a manufacturing point of view to be able to handle, you know, some of these areas and some of these you know 
different types mm-hmm. of situations. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit more. And um, David, I'd, I'd actually love love to jump to have you jump in here and talk about uh, any you know things you can bring around this this idea of the difference in performance between consumer devices and you know ruggedized devices and you know power capabilities of those devices. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll maybe try to sort of piggyback on on some of the things that Andrew was uh, was 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 sharing. So. I think the first thing that is, is is also important to state is there is no one size fits all solution uh, when it comes to mobility, um, and there are so many different sort of factors that come into play uh, when you know considering not only the device but also things like display size, things like levels of ruggedness, things like what type of you know I/O or input requirements do you need. So I think it's always important to first start with. What is the problem we're we trying to solve? What is the environment we're trying to solve this in? And what well, ultimately, what outcomes are we trying to affect? Um, so, in the case of of you know the uh, the healthcare example with with nurse productivity, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the driving catalyst behind a lot of uh, mobility investments is is productivity and productivity enhancements. It really is a you know a workforce multiplier when done right. Um, so, so in the case of nurses, I'll just, you know, research that we did a couple of years ago suggested that, you know, the average nurse practitioner was spending roughly, you know, one fifth, maybe one quarter of their shift in a patient facing capacity. In other words, the majority of the day was spent running around looking for stuff, um, you know, doing administrative tasks. In other words, not really uh, providing care, and ultimately what the uh, what the job uh, is 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 dependent upon. Um, so, you know, well-designed mobile solutions that provided the right information at the right time uh, in the right environment uh, was able to, re- you know, increase the amount of patient-facing uh, time that nurses had by as much as you know 100 to 150 um, percent in 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 the average shift. So, so really significant. When thinking about uh, you know the potential uh, for um, uh, you know for uh, you know for the workforce, uh, but at the same time it's important to also take into account um, you know sort of the mission or business criticality of the of the solution or of the uh, yeah it's the solution that you're looking to implement. In other words, when things go wrong, and they will go wrong. Um, uh, you know, with any mobile solution, no matter how well designed it is, we have to we have to anticipate some level of of failure. What happens, and how disruptive is that impact? Um, so, in particular, with these sort of what we call business or mission critical workflows, um, it's you know we're never going to eliminate failure or downtime, but the idea is to is to minimize that as much as possible. So those things then cater to or or address. Okay, what is you know what type of considerations do you have from a performance standpoint for a mobile solution? So when things go wrong, what typically are the factors that that contribute to that failure? So there are, there are factors that that align with the sort of the physical nature of the device, the device itself, the hardware itself. So Andrew had mentioned dropping the device um, and that causing some level of failure. Um, maybe exposure or need to disinfect device if it's in a um, uh, sort of a clinical type of uh, type of environment. Um, but even beyond that, thinking about, and this is really really where we where we saw a lot of the early you know deployments of sort of these consumer ish devices into business or mission critical workflows was around battery performance. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and here, you know, not everyone always has access to a charger. Um, and what we have found in, you know, the research that we saw that the number one contributor to disruption to mobile uh, solutions when, you know, deploying, uh, you know, a, a um, sort of a consumer oriented device was degradation of the battery, battery life and a failure for a battery to last an entire shift. In other words, eight to 10 hours. Um, and 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 that has a, had a, a significant, especially over the life cycle of a device. So maybe in the first six to eight months yeah. with a consumer device, you might not see anything noticeable. But once that life cycle extends beyond six, eight, twelve months, and the performance habits of 
you know, frequently charging these devices and, and using them in a very sort of 24-7 capacity, because oftentimes it's not one device per person, but it's one device per shift, uh, so they're being used 24 hours a day, that can have significant wear on the performance of the device. So you start to see erosion of performance, battery life performance, processing performance, uh, you know, fairly quickly with devices that aren't necessarily designed to operate either in a clinical setting or in a, um, you know, in the field exposed to sort of inclement weather conditions or even in a, in a retail setting, which you might think is fairly benign, um, you know, from an environmental standpoint, but just the rigors of um, just using these devices, you know, 16, 24 hours a day over multiple shifts. Um, you know, can very quickly sort of expose the vulnerabilities, be it, again, battery, be it just physical device, be even, even things like, you know, wireless performance, as, as Andrew was, was indicating. Oftentimes, right. these devices aren't yeah. tuned to, to, to work in those, in those states. Yeah, David, I, I think you bring up a, a, a great point around that, around the, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about, you know, the, the ruggedness of the devices, but the battery performance especially. And it, as we're looking at things like a retail space where you have different people coming in and using the same device and not, you know, knowing how long it's been used, how long it's been up and running. And um, Andrew, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, on, you know, the right now, I mean, if you have an iPhone, you can't, you know, switch out the battery at all, you know, unless you take it in and get replaced. Um, you know, Android devices, some of them are swappable, but they're not hot swappable. And can you talk a little exactly. bit about, about the importance of that in, in these environments? Yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking, the one one thing that differentiates the purpose-built devices, Spectralinks or any competitive ones, is this ability to swap out the batteries. The uh, you know one the first uh, knee-jerk reaction to hey I need longer battery life is hey just include more capacity in the battery, put in a bigger battery, it'll last longer which starts off down a good path till you realize that batteries weigh a lot. They're actually one of the heaviest components in a device. And that impacts the end user satisfaction with the device. It's, it's heavy to carry around. It, uh, if you put it in a pocket, it tugs on your, uh, your pocket or your uniform all day long. Um, it's, it's, that's not the solution that most end users want. Yes, you've got a design for optimizing the battery life using components that uh, that will minimize power consumption. But really, at the end of that shift, after that uh, 10, 12 hour sort of time frame, you're going to want to swap the batteries. And so most of the purpose built manufacturers have given folks the ability to swap in a new battery. Uh, typically, uh, we see batteries sell at a rate roughly two batteries for each phone. So there'll be the main battery that, uh, that comes with the device and is in there. And people are buying a backup battery as well. So one battery can be in a charger while, the, uh, while one is being used. And then you can just, uh, it's as simple as pop one battery out, put in a new one, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to swap that. And, uh, and then you just continue on with a, a fully charged battery. As you mentioned, that notion of hot swappable, though, uh, Spectralink really took a lead with our Versity product and uh, took an extra step to, uh, to have a very small backup battery in the, uh, the Versity smartphone, which is enough to continue to power the display, the wireless connection, all of that, and keep the phone alive while you do that swap. So one of our complaints uh, from many customers was uh, was needing to do that battery swap, but needing to shut down and then wait for a phone to restart and then log into all the applications that they were using. And they were losing, in terms of productivity, uh, five, ten minutes of time every time they needed to do a, uh, a battery change. With, uh, with the backup, the hot swap capability that we've added in, they're a lot happier because at any given moment where the battery might be low, it takes them about five seconds to pop out the battery and put a new one in. The phone is always on during that time. So if calls come in, uh, they're not missing anything during that restart, uh, they're still connected. And just that bar uh, for the inconvenience level has been, uh, has been greatly lowered. Uh, and then the other piece of this comes in in terms of that total cost of ownership, right? It's a lot less costly to buy 
a uh, one additional backup battery than an empty or another entire phone. If you go to uh, go to that iPhone example that uh, that you talked about, the uh, the iPhone has a built-in battery. It can't be charged, so one person uses it through that whole shift, and the battery is drained. The next person comes in for their shift. That person can't pop in a new battery and just go. They have to either have a fully charged additional phone waiting in order to uh, to swap out, or they need to uh, or they need to put that phone on the charger and not use it for a couple of hours. So that's uh, it. Really comes down to that productivity and total cost of ownership, uh, being able to have a purpose built device with a swappable battery in it. Yeah, and Andrew, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head of that. And, you know, we keep going back to durability and productivity, you know, and there's this idea yeah. of, you know, performance, having, having a device that actually works well, but having a device that is always on and always available. And I, I think the hot swappable capability is, is something that, you know, a lot of people, you know, haven't thought about, but becomes very important when you're in a situation where, you know, you, you can't wait for that device to reboot and go through that cycle and you know you, you need something that's going to just be available to you and so I, i'd like to jump in and um offer up one more poll question uh see um you know what our audience is looking at with their devices and um you know this this poll question goes to that that idea of having purpose-built devices specific, devices for specific purposes so it's, does your organization have a need for devices that serve specific purposes or do you use devices for general connectivity and off-the-shelf apps? And um, so we've got these questions up here. I'd like to open up the poll real quick and give you all an opportunity to answer that. And while we're waiting, so Andrew, uh, what, what have you guys seen? Have you seen a, a good mix or do you have a lot of customers, clients that just come in and they say, we, we, have, we have a specific need. We, we have to have these kind of devices and we can't use off-the-shelf. Yeah, it it varies, of course. Everybody, uh, everybody has their own use case there. But I think, uh, for the most part, customers, when they're talking to us, have decided that you can't use off the shelf. They need, uh, they need something specific, and they're trying to do a. It's not just one application that's driving the uh, the purpose. It's a mix of several things they want these uh, these frontline workers to do. Um, you know, from a uh, Back to the, the notion of retail. In retail stores, you need to be able to uh, do push to talk and communicate amongst other employees in the store. In, uh, in retail, you also need to do um, mobile checkout, right? So you need to have the ability to, to run tra through a transaction on the phone, be able to integrate with a point of sale terminal to process credit cards. Uh, all of those, uh, those are keys there. To uh, to that successful uh, successful deployment in retail, uh, hospitality similar uh, similar use cases. People want to have applications that uh, that they're building around uh, in inventory, uh, being able to uh, to notice status of rooms, being able to check on customers, be able to do task management. Uh, is those are all key uh, in these individual verticals. So. Each vertical is a little different, and then within each vertical, of course, there's always multiple software sources. In some cases, we see uh, the customers writing their own software. In others, there's uh, large, well-established well firms that, uh, that are dominant in the vertical that, uh, that provide software. But uh, you know, being able to test, being able to integrate, being able to certify that that solution works, and give customer confidence going in to a deployment is something that becomes very, very important. The uh, Spectralink spends a lot of time in its technology partnership programs working with everybody from access point vendors to make sure that roaming is seamless on voice, uh, integrating to, uh, to call server partners, making sure that the, uh, the calls with the, uh, the various call servers work, and then certifying with application uh, vendors as well, making sure that they can use the uh, the buttons on the phone, uh, integrate to those, integrate to uh, to the APIs that we're able to provide, so they get enhanced management, uh, the ability to uh, you know go back to healthcare and alerts and alarms. It users can turn up and down a phone, 
being able to have an application override that volume setting. So when a code blue alert comes in for somebody, you know it's going to be heard even if they had the phone on silence because that's critical and somebody's life is on the line. Uh, right. Is capabilities that you're not going to find in, in those consumer devices and, uh, and leads customers to just believe that off the shelf just isn't going to work. Yeah, no, that's that's some great information. So, okay, let's go ahead and close up the poll and take a look at um, what our audience is looking at today. And yeah, oh, it's it's actually a, a pretty good mix. I mean, it's, it's almost half as mix of devices, but we've got you know all, upwards of a third that are looking at specific purposes. So that it's it's interesting. And you know, um, Andrew, I, I like you know what you were talking about on the retail front. I I love the idea of mobile checkout. It's you know something that I've, I've worked on for a, a long time and, you know, being able to, to skip the line and just find someone, you know, but, and be able to, yeah. you know, get out of the store, but having that connectivity and having that specific device, that's going to be able to, you know, hit all those bases. People don't, a lot of people don't really realize that they just see it as, Oh, it's just, you know, yep. of course you have a mobile device that can check me out, not realizing all the things that have to work in conjunction there yeah. to well, we've actually seen, uh... make it happen. And what we've seen from some of our retail customers is, uh, of course, the impact of Amazon on their business. Uh, everybody wants a good price. Everybody knows that if you've got an Amazon account, it can be delivered to you somewhere between two hours and two days, and it'll be there. So they actually face a pretty large trend of consumers being in the store looking at items physically in the store, deciding what they like, and then hopping on their phone and just ordering it from Amazon, and then that retailer lost the sale. By being able to take a uh, that retail worker and remove them from the check stand where they would be checking people out, putting them on the floor, lets them interface with folks before they make that uh, alternative sale with Amazon and they can really drive that to, hey, I can help you with this right here. We can do that checkout. Uh, you, we can verify the, the price works for you. You know, all of that happens right there. And uh, they've seen a huge trend in when unfettering and untethering those, uh, those workers, they've seen uh, a huge loss or a huge reduction in loss of sales to, uh, to online environments. Yeah, oh, absolutely. All right, great. So let's let's go ahead and jump into our, our next topic here. And um, what I want to talk about now is getting into that that durability question and having those ruggedized devices. And you know, it, it, ruggedized devices for a long time were a very specialized you know field, and you know, not a lot of people were aware of them. And still, you know, the the general you know, corporate worker probably isn't aware of them, but many enterprises need them even in in a corporate space. And um, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about that. And um, Andrew, I'm going to come to you first. And then, David, I want to get some info from you. But Andrew, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the types of ruggedized devices we're seeing coming into the enterprise space now um, outside of, you know, what traditionally we've seen is the ones that just have to be out in like the oil and gas fields? Yep. Yeah. The, uh, so, you, you know, starting with that, that's what, uh, that's what people, you say rugged device and people fit, think of that big brick phone, right? That, uh, you know, it's an inch thick, uh, you can throw it off the top of the building yep. and it's going <laughs> to bounce its way down the street and survive. And, you know, that's great. But for the most part, these enterprise workers that we're talking about, that's not what's going on with their phones. They're walking down a, uh, a hallway and they're dropping it or it's getting dropped into water. Um, so there's, uh, there's drop tests. Uh, that are key. Drops are not just the screen shattering things that we've all probably experienced on our uh, our consumer phones, but they're uh, they're also jarring to the internal mechanicals of the device. So, as a manufacturer, you have to think about you know, what happens when you drop a phone. Where does it land? How do the components move and absorb the impact and the shock of that? And so you've got to plan around that. At the same time, we do see the end workers really rebel against that traditional form factor that's uh, big and heavy because it's big and heavy. They don't want to carry it around. It doesn't fit comfortably in a pocket. It doesn't integrate with the rest of the stuff that they have to do. 
And so really trying to find that, that unique balance between have a device that's rugged enough to survive the, uh, the tough environments that people have. We already mentioned hospital cleansers. We mentioned dropping the device. And so you got to be rugged enough to survive all that while at the same time still being slim and sleek and light and looking like a consumer phone that somebody actually wants to carry around. And so there's, that becomes the engineering challenge in trying to, uh, to find that, uh, that middle ground. I think Spectralink did a great job in building this Versity smartphone uh, where we were able to, uh, to combine that ruggedness. We do drop testing of our phone uh, from six feet on the steel plate multiple times through the mil spec test. Uh, so from that perspective, it's, uh, it's really rugged, can handle a bunch of big drops. But the other stuff that we do is, is testing uh, longer term durability, right? We do a, what's called a tumble test. If you can imagine a steel cylinder about uh, half a meter long, put the phone in it and make the, establish a phone call, right? Uh, then be able to turn on that drum and have it rotate slowly like your dryer at home and just watch the phone bounce end to end to end in the steel tube for, uh, for 500 tumbles through that, uh, through that environment, all without dropping that call. That means all of those connections in the phone have to be solid. The battery can't be falling out. You, can't, you really just got to stand up to that environment. We also do a micro drop test, which simulates you, uh, you walking into your office and you just toss the phone onto your desk. So we have a 10, 10 centimeter drop, not very hot, tall, but it's still an impact. And those impacts add up over time. So again, we do that 10 centimeter drop 10,000 times all while sustaining a call in order for, uh, for this phone to be durable enough. So those are the sorts of things and perspectives that we add when we're talking about making sure that this device is meant to last, meant to stand up to the environments. Uh, we build with, uh, with internal walls inside the device, a whole chassis built inside the device to keep those components in place. Uh, we pick components like Gorilla Glass over the top to make sure the glass is, uh, is not likely to break and uh, design latches and buttons to, uh, to ensure they, uh, they last as well. There's a lot that goes into uh, to engineering that device durability. Well, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. And you, you keep going back to that, that productivity. I mean, you're talking about not having, you know, the call drop while all that's happening. Now, if you could just find out how to make it work in an elevator. That, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we figured but, um, that out, you know, we... but it breaks fire codes. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, uh, the now, fire I mean, stations they... don't like having antennas in that elevator call. I, I can imagine, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, um, you know, that durability and the, the productivity are, are so important. David, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, we, we talk about productivity, but, you know, what do we look at when it comes to the cost of that? I mean, we're talking about, you know, having a device that's, that's going to last, you know, multiple years in, in multiple environments. But, you know, a lot of people still are going with those consumer devices and, you know, just trying to purpose, you know, reuse them for purposes that they're really not designed for. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, those hidden costs and, you know, what we see? Sure, sure. Um, you know, because that's at the end of the day, uh, sort of the X factor to the to this. And again, going back to the point I introduced earlier, there there is no one perfect solution for all uh, uh, for all types of use cases. You have to take all these factors that uh, you know Andrew was was talking about into um, into consideration. But but absent of that, and, and this is you know maybe the um, you know sort of the uh, the ugly secret of 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 mobility is that it is such a great Productivity um, enhancer, enabler, uh, but also when done wrong or when when not designed, you know, quite right, uh, it can it can have the opposite impact or the opposite effect. So let me let me put some context around that. Um, so on average, when a device fails, um, and it will, um, you see a productivity for and and here I'm talking about devices that are being used in you know, very much integrated within a workflow, um, sort of what we call business critical or mission critical workflows. So that can be the nurse practitioner, can be the retail associate, can be the field service technician. Uh, but when that device does fail, on average, that worker uh, loses about 80 to 85 minutes of productivity. And so you might say, okay, 
So, you know, what's what's you know how often does that fail? And and you know what? So so that doesn't really mean you know mean a mean, mean a lot. I can I can absorb that. That's not a big deal. But when you start thinking then about the frequency of failure, when you don't have a device that operates as expected, when you know the battery goes dead, when you're dropping you know sort of drop, dropping points of connection, when you're introducing even frustration, because again at the end of the day when when we think about mobility, it is a little bit of a dance of compromises. And one of the biggest challenges, absent of finding the right device, is also delivering an experience to the customer, in this case, um, your employee, uh, that is a positive one. If, if they get frustrated with the device, with the solution, they'll also stop using it uh, or stop using it as intended. So that needs to be taken into consideration. But but on average, if I'm just you know boiling everything down and looking at sort of purpose-built, you know quote unquote you know ruggedized uh, devices versus a consumer device, and here I'm talking not about you know you know the worker in an intrinsically safe or an environment with the risk of explosion, but I'm talking about for the most part your everyday line of business worker, um, the failure of a poorly design solution or you know using you know devices that aren't intended for that purpose is usually about three to four x that of a well-designed solution uh, so you have a failure rates of you know ranging from two to three percent to 14 15 18 percent uh, for workers so when you start to meet, do that math UK okay, each failure costs 85 minutes uh, you have an FTE of anywhere from say 30 to 50 maybe 85 dollars per hour um, and then you factor that in over 250 days per year. Uh, you know, you're quickly approaching um, a, the cost of that lost productivity, just the lost productivity, not the cost of, you know, technical support, et cetera, per worker in the neighborhood of five to $6,000 per year. And you multiply that across 500 workers or across 1,000 workers, and you start to see sort of this duplicative impact of, Great. I was thought I was introducing productivity. I thought I was going to be making my workforce more productive, but suddenly you have the reverse impact. Um, so I think that you know it's important for organizations to you know approach this sort of with their eyes wide open to do as much testing as they can do uh, to find that right balance. Again, you're not going to get a perfect solution, but and you're not going to throw the most rugged device at each you know, worker. Otherwise, you're going to end up with something that's so heavy and bulky. Um, and they're not going to use it. They're not going to be comfortable using it. Um, but I think that, you know, it's important to understand that, okay, what happens when that device fails? How quickly can I triage, assess that problem? How much visibility do I have into that? So that you're never going to get it to zero, but at least I can minimize it as much as possible. So I'm not sacrificing productivity uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of, those, uh, of those points of failure. Yeah, absolutely, and that 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 makes a lot of sense. And I mean, it just the the sheer costs there are, are amazing when you really break it down the way you did right there, David. I appreciate that. Now, I know we're going to be coming up on time and not too long. And there's a couple more topics I do want to jump into. Um, first off, I want to get into device management, and I just want to touch quickly on this um, because you know, in the enterprise, just just about every enterprise organization right now has some level of um, you know enterprise mobility management or device management. And um, as we look at these, you know, these specifically designed devices, and um, Andrew, I'd like to throw this at you, just looking at from, you know, Spectralink is a company that really builds devices that are designed for specific verticals to do specific tasks. And mm -hmm. do you have your own device management software? And how would, how would that integrate in with, you know, um, existing MDMs and um, enterprise mobility management that an enterprise might already have? Do they have to have a separate setup or can they integrate together? So, yeah, so Spectralink took a long, hard look at that uh, as we launched our Versity smartphone and really determined exactly what you're saying. Most of our customers already had an EMM solution in place, and, uh, and they seem to be generally happy with that. Uh, and if they were going to move, they were going to move to another known EMM solution, not necessarily to Spectralink. So we've really designed a, a Spectralink tool to work hand-in-hand with those EMMs in particular. So the smartphone that we provide does integrate well with, uh, with those EMM solutions, be it uh, AirWatch, 
Sodi, Mobile Iron, Microsoft Intune, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the customer can stick with what they've got, what they know, and what they've already established, and uh, our device will integrate uh, perfectly well with that. The software that we provide is less about device management and more about provisioning of Spectralink applications on the device. So Google and the uh, the application community have uh, have developed a set of software uh, that allows EMM to configure applications, uh, and those EMMs uh, write to a community called the uh, called uh, Android Enterprise uh, Configuration, and that uh, that functionality is out there, but the way the EMMs take advantage of it, it's really difficult for people. It's not uh, a nice GUI interface. There's a lot of command line that has to be done in order to properly provision applications that are going to be used on these devices. So we took a step forward for our customers and the applications that Spectralink provides, things like control of the scanner in the device, things like control of battery monitoring in the device, things like the uh, the SIP dialer that we provide and doing the configuration for what's your extension and how do you log into that extension, all of those sorts of things. Uh, we provide software that makes the configuration of all of that substantially easier and really goes beyond what you would get out of trying to do that through, uh, through an EML. So uh, we've really designed our stuff to work hand in hand uh, very well, very complementary with uh, with those EMM partners, and and try to just be a, a good member of this overall ecosystem and community. And that that makes a lot of sense. It makes it easier for an enterprise to you know add on rather than trying to retool. So that's that's great. And okay, exactly. Um, we are we are getting uh, near the top of the hour, and I do have one more poll question I want to jump into here. And um, what this is, it's talking about the cost, and we've been talking a lot about total cost of ownership. So one thing that um, I found in my research, and um, David, I'm sure you've seen this also, is that a lot of organizations don't look at the soup to nuts when it comes to mobility. So I'd like to ask uh, everyone in the audience, um, has your organization tracked or reviewed the TCO associated with your full mobile solution? And it's just a simple yes or no. You know, have you just looked at the cost of the devices, or have you looked at the solution on the whole going – you know, from everything that um, Andrew and David have been talking about, you know, whether that be the, the durability of the device, the productivity, the downtime coming with us uh, swapping out batteries uh, and, you know, the, the downtime associated with the device being down. I mean, it, David talked about, you know, the, the cost of a device being down just for, you know, an hour and a half can run you, you know, huge amounts of dollars over the um, course of a year. So these, these are all the things that you have to look at when you're looking at mobility on the whole. So I, I'm very interested to hear, you know, your thoughts on this and um, then we'll jump back into it and then wrap up with a couple things here. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. And yeah, there, there's still, you know, a, a good portion of you have looked at that TCO, um, you know, but there's still a lot in the, you know, I, I've, I've seen this a lot, you know, with, when it comes to enterprise mobility over the years, I, I actually did some specific research with one of my financial guys on, you know, what the costs are associated all the way through. And it, it really gets to everything that Andrew and David have been talking about. So this, this is very interesting. For those of you who are looking at the TCO on the whole, that's, that's fantastic. I'm hoping that this has given you some great information. For those of you who are, you know, still have just been thinking about, you know, how to handle this, I'm really hoping that we're able to provide you some data. So we're going to jump right into, um, one of the, our last topic here, which is looking at uh, support of these devices. And, you know, we, we've talked about the, you know, the, the different verticals that we're looking at and, you know, how they have to be handled in different ways and, you know, what we look at when it comes to support. And um, David, I'd like to throw this at you and just, you know, look at when it comes to supporting these devices, you know, what have you seen in your research or some of the, the big pitfalls that, you know, people run into? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll maybe sort of pick up a little bit on, on sort of the MDM, EMM uh, discussion because I think that's sort of pivotal um, to, I think, a well-designed and, and, and well-deployed uh, enterprise mobility solution. Um, you know, I, I'll make one, you know, maybe sort of, I guess, slight disagreement, um, you know, with what's been said around uh, EMM. I mean, I agree, certainly most 
uh, any enterprise mobility solution will be accompanied with a, an EMM solution. However, I think the majority of them still today are fairly basic in their functionality. In other words, they're, they're sort of the core, what we initially refer to as mobile device management, which has now evolved into a, a more comprehensive enterprise mobility management, uh, uh, you know, sort of a suite. And the challenge I find that organizations don't necessarily plan for, um, and, and it is, you know, incredibly important to, uh, to provide, is, is really around visibility. Um, and visibility of your, of your mobile assets uh, in terms of not only being able to locate them, uh, which in and of itself oftentimes is a, is a, a very challenging proposition, uh, but also visibility and analytics in terms of their performance, so that you can uh, very quickly identify what's, you know, what is the cause of a problem that maybe needs to be addressed, and ideally um, be able to address it without requiring the device to come back into some type of a service depot, et cetera, so you can address it remotely. Um, so, so uh, you know, a lot of organizations are just starting to introduce, you know, fairly sophisticated levels of analytics around everything around, you know, data usage, application usage, overall device health, uh, device location, connectivity capabilities, uh, battery performance. Battery is great from this standpoint in the sense that it's always a great indicator of um, something that might not be going right. So in other words, if the battery drain is faster than you might anticipate, it's usually a good indication of a poorly designed application or maybe something else that, that could be wrong. So to have that visibility into your mobile estate, to be able to enable more predictive or proactive uh, you know, approaches to issues even before they might happen uh, is, is, is certainly very critical in terms of minimizing or reducing cost of ownership uh, and and providing that uh, that level of support. That's yeah no I, I I totally agree with you on that, uh, David. And I I think it it is important that you know people be able to see all aspects of it. And um you know I I know we we've talked quite a bit about you know all the different things that can you know impact your uh, total costs and drive down your ROI overall. And um, I've I've really appreciated yeah. you know this this discussion that we've been having here and, you know, everything that you guys have brought to the table. And, you know, as, as we wrap up here, I just want to, you know, end with, you know, this idea of, you know, as we've gone through these five really critical areas when it comes to mobility is, you know, what, what I've seen and I think what, what we've, we've validated here is, you know, having the right device for what you're trying to accomplish, knowing that, you know, there isn't one device that fits all situations. It's not a one size fits all. And then, you know, what you were just talking about, David, that, that capability to have the support, whether that be, you know, supporting the idea of the device itself, whether it be a hot swappable battery, a device that, you know, is always going to be on, always going to be durable and last, you know, for a lot longer than, you know, what we see in the consumer um, areas. And then, then having the right partner. And, you know, I, I really want to thank you, Andrew, for, for joining us today from Spectral Link and giving some insights into, you know, the solutions that you guys have been developing and what you've been working on and been putting out there. And, um, you know, we are coming up to the end. So I, I'd love to leave it to you guys. Um, Andrew, I'd love to give you the last word actually, because it looks like we don't have any questions from the field. I, I think you guys obviously have done a fantastic job of answering everyone's questions before mm -hmm. they have them. So um, I, I'd love to leave you Andrew, the, the last word here as we go ahead and wrap up. Sure. So yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of the deployments, right? It is important to uh, to think about those success factors up front. You know, as you as we encounter customers who think they want a mobility solution but aren't sure of what's involved, uh, we find that the most successful deployments happen when we get to sit down with the customer up front, talk through. What does success look like to them? How is this project going to be evaluated? Is it on productivity of those end users? Are they trying to hit certain cost targets? What uh, what drives that overall deployment? And what is uh, what is that shared vision of success look like? Uh, if we can get through that, then uh, 
then absolutely it, uh, it turns out into a, uh, a very solid deployment, one where, uh, where the customer's needs were understood, one where we could help them architect out the, uh, the solutions that are there, what applications they want to run. Uh, you spend the time up front to validate and make sure that those applications are going to work, are going to run well, uh, aren't an uh, application that's going to cause battery drain, as David mentioned. It, uh, those are all things to think about. Try up front. Uh, a lot of successful uh, deployments start with a, uh, a simple proof of concept with 5, 10, 15 devices in production with a limited number of employees, document the learnings from that, and then be able to, uh, to take that and roll it out full scale across an entire organization uh, is really key. Uh, for those, going back to your last poll question as well, for those that have the, uh, the TCO or haven't evaluated that or interested in a deeper dive there, uh, SpectreLink does have some tools on our website to allow you to go in, put in some information. Uh, it will feed us the, uh, that initial information. We can come back with a, a calculation of whether we think we're in a spot to be able to help around, uh, around TCO and what you're seeing, and can then certainly tee up some follow-up. Our, uh, our teams have deeper TCO calculators, and we're, our team's happy to, uh, to have conversations with uh, prospective customers around TCO for the devices, what that total cost of ownership looks like, and uh, and how our devices uh, is potentially di different from other solutions they're seeing. Uh, that's that's great, Andrew. Thank thank you so much. And I I know that you know David, Andrew, the three of us could probably spend you know the the next hour continuing on, but I think we're going to have to leave it there. And um, I want to thank both of you for joining this today. Uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. I also want to thank everyone in the audience for for attending today. Really appreciate your time. And um, hope you got some great information. And uh, feel free to uh, get in touch with us here at GigaOM for uh, any questions you have. And also, you know, um, feel free to go to SpectreLink, take a look at uh, what Andrew was talking about there, talking about TCO and all of that. So once again, thank you all for uh, joining. And Andrew, David, thank you guys very much for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks much. It was a great, uh, great session. Thanks.